group really. <laughs> no, no, um, no, no, no. So, no, but no, I mean, so the, no, 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 so that, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I got up to ask this question when you said, you know, Hume was really um, opposed to grounding uh, the moral order in reason, and uh, Hume, uh, and yes. so. Uh, I thought, yeah, see, this would be actually a, a very different way of, of setting up your camps, actually. You know, there are, there are those guys like Hume who deny that. There are those guys like Bale who deny that. So I would group Bale and Hume in one camp. And no, then there no, are no. other guys like Kant and Leibniz who embrace that, but not necessarily because they have some sort of theological hang-up or something like that. I think, I mean, this, one would have to say more about that, but... Um, I mean, in Kant, I think uh, this whole um, uh, religious uh, uh, backbone structure can really be cut off uh, cleanly from the moral philosophy, and you have really just uh, a foundation and reason. And so I think that would be a nice setup and a very enlightenment setup, you know, the foundation of the moral order and reason, and there you get progress and change, and, you know, as people become better and understand things better. And then the other guys, and, you know, that's like bail and you know, group everybody else in that group. But Leibniz and Kahn turn out to be, you know, the good guys on the side of reason. <laughs> 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 <Okay. laughs> okay, well, I, I think reason is a fundamental to all enlightenment. And it's only the counter-enlightenment that more or less reject reason. Uh, he, he, Hume minimizes, wants to restrict the scope of reason as much as possible, but he still thinks it's important for, for, for seeing what is uh, uh, politically and morally valid and what isn't and so on. I think the basic difference is that the, what I call the moderate enlightenment are saying that uh, reason, although a crucial tool for human improvement and for, for, for finding better, for, for, for defining the reforms we need and so on, has to be balanced against um, faith, Belief, or in Hume's case, tradition, uh, or in it, uh, what it amounts to is an indirect acceptance of religion in, 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 in Hume. But in any case, it's not reason alone. Whereas what Spinoza and his legacy are doing, really, is, is, is presenting us with an enlightenment that want to base uh, the reform of human life and our appraisals of reality on reason alone uncompromisingly, reason tempered by nothing else. There, there isn't any revelation or faith or religious authority for them. Reason is the only tool uh, that is relevant to this, 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 this program of, of human improvement. So it, that, that's the difference, that for, for, for the moderate enlightenment, it's, it, it's reason tempered by uh, religious faith in one form or another. And I, despite what you say about Kant, I, I can't agree with that. There's, uh, I, Probably you know much more about Kant than I do, but as I understand Kant's moral philosophy, uh, one, one cannot take away, and uh, certainly historically in the 1780s, um, and if you read Reinhold, this is clear, that, that people saw and interpreted Kant's system as a way of defending religious authority and as a way of blocking Spinozism, and this is what actually made it very acceptable for many people in the later 1780s. Um, but uh, it, it, it seems to me inherent in, in his moral, moral philosophy, but obviously we disagree about that. Christine. Hi. Um, thanks for your talk. Again, uh, you've also been very influential on my work um, in a similar way to uh, you've been influential on Mike's work, and we've reacted in fairly the same way, I think. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, the above reason against reason distinction, um, but at since I'm running out of time, I have a question about moral neutrality that I'm actually going to ask instead and uh, point you to my paper that I gave on Wednesday night. Um, those of you who heard that can probably guess what I have to say about that. Um, so I'm curious about uh, this phrase, morally neutral, that you use on page five. Uh, you call Spinoza and Bale the two architects of a morally neutral universe. And then again, on the next page, um, you make the claim that the universe is morally neutral for both of these two thinkers, and that their, that morality should therefore be based not on some supposed divinely given code, but instead on the principle of social utility, the main justification Bale gives for his sweeping toleration. Um, and then one last time, Bale's separation of morality from theology imply a moral and social revolution, 
moral values have now to be reconstructed on a new basis, and that basis is the equivalence in Spinoza of every individual's needs and interests, though Bale lays this principle down explicitly only in relation to freedom of belief and conscience. Yeah. So you've made the case that uh, for both Spinoza and Bale, they reject a providential conception of the world. Yeah. But, uh, and I think there's room to quibble on that with respect to Bale. Um, but um, what I'm most concerned with is that uh, there seems to be space between not basing one's morality on a providential conception of God and the fact of the world being morally neutral. Um, it seems to me that um, it, it, if, this, if that's right, the space would be something like the existence of common notions, um, Bale actually uses that phrase pretty regularly, um, to refer to something about the order of the universe um, that is accessible to reason um, only with respect to moral truths, um, something like brute moral facts. Um, and if that's right, then the universe is not morally neutral for Bale, <laughs> despite the fact that um, he has succeeded in divorcing morality from theology. Yeah. Uh, well, the, it, precisely the separation of morality from theology was what I chiefly had in mind. What I meant was that, uh, that, that uh, in Spinoza and in Bale, I, the universe is, uh, is a morally neutral force, That's, that, it, it, that there's no divine providence which is uh, delivering morality to men. I think those are two different claims, though. It seems to me that there's space between those two claims. Yeah. Perhaps that's something we should pursue in more detail, more easily in conversation rather okay. than this uh, format. But I think that uh, just, just to make one remark about uh, Bale's toleration, of, it seems to me a very clear example where he's saying that if we were to follow uh, scripture or divine um, injunction, then uh, religious intolerance would have to be the path forward. And the reason why we can't do that is that it's going to lead to... Um, uh, different religions mutually slaughtering each other, an uh, anarchic situation and great destruction. And uh, it, it's reason that tells us that we have to accept um, toleration and freedom of conscience of all individuals because that is the only way of uh, diffusing what would otherwise be extremely explosive and destructive for mankind. So it, it, it seems to me that Bale... Uh, this is this is a clear example of something Bale does repeatedly. That that he uh, also in his political thought that uh, he for, that reason is uh, is actually the instrument that tells us that shows us the moral principle which will guide us to the correct solution when scripture and r religious authority can't. And I think that's a that's a pattern constantly recurring in Bale, despite the way he presents his arguments, which I think is deliberately intended to, to mislead the reader in certain respects, particularly in the Dictionnaire. Okay. We'll talk more about it later. <laughs> this is the, the place to conclude the session. One uh, very important announcement with regard to tomorrow. We begin at 9.45 tomorrow. <laughs> um, Jonathan, thank you very much for a stimulating <laughs> session.